Well, it's 12 p.m. here in California, and I'd like to welcome all of you to Zooming In, weekly curatorial conversations from the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life at UC Berkeley. I'm Shil Gal Kuchavi, Assistant Curator, and joining me is Francesco Spagnolo, hey, the Magnus sure. Curator. Hi, Ma hi. <laughs> good to see you, Francesco. We're starting to get used to meeting every Friday, huh? Yeah, every we'll, Friday. We'll carry the series through through December, so we're, uh, we are uh, going to uh, and and just just a second, we have while while you 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 give uh, information on how this is going to work, I'm going to uh, make sure that we are uh, visible. Gladly. So just a bit of housekeeping to start with. All participants have their cameras turned off, but you can interact with us in two ways. Uh, in the lower bar bar of your screens, you can use the chat button to let us know of any technical difficulties. Or if you'd like to also share, share with us where you're connecting from around the world, and you can use the Q&A button for any questions you might have. We'll be presenting for approximately 20 minutes and leave some time at the end for any questions you might have. Every week we'll be presenting research done on either one or several objects from our collection, alternating back and forth, uh, taking lead on these different conversations. Thank you, Nat, our colleague who's helping us man manage our webinar today. Yeah, and As a, trying to help me figure out how we can all be seen. Um, oh dear! Currently, yeah, I'm, I'm, there is something going on. So, now so I'm gonna. So I'm. Us. I'm gonna remind everybody of the Magnus Collection and what it is uh, while we finish up our managing our technical issues today. Uh, the Magnus Collection is one of the largest Jewish museum Jewish museum collections of the world. It's one of the three top Jewish museum collections in the United States and the only one in the world that's associated with a major research university. Um, we're very happy to be able to present these talks to you on a weekly basis and we hope that this is not the first one you're joining so far. Uh, but if it is, hopefully you will, you'll enjoy it and feel free to contact us with any follow-up questions or continue researching any of the work that we've been doing on our website that is down below on the screen or using the email that's down below on the left of your screens. Um, today, we're, we chose an interesting topic. Uh, we were thinking of doctors and nurses working all over the world to save lives and curb the effects of co the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this was also a reminder for us of this extraordinary doctor's diploma uh, that was given in 1682 um, at the University of Padua, Italy, to a Jewish student named Emmanuel Colli, a document that, as we realize, represents so much more than the graduation of an individual from the university. Today in our conversation, we'll explore uh, four different topics. We'll start with the multiculturalism of Jews in the Venice ghetto, uh, then we'll move into what it means to be an international student of, in 17th century Italy. We'll move into the important, important 17th century institutions in Padua, as the University of Padua that dates back to 13th century and different synagogues around the city. And we'll end by looking at examples of Paduan mentors, rabbis and doctors and their relationships. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, luckily for us, we have our fantastic resident Italian on call today, Francesco Spagnolo, to take us through this journey. Thank you, Shir. Um, yes, as you were saying, we are, our, our conversation today is centered on this, uh, on this uh, very interesting document. Um, it's uh, been part of the Magnus Collection for decades, and uh, he went on loan to Venice, to the Ducal Palace in Venice in 2016, when the city of Venice marked the 500th anniversary of the establishment of the, of the Jewish ghetto. Uh, as a reminder, we'll go over that. That's the place where the word ghetto comes from. And um, so we're going to kind of explore the codes of this, uh, of this manuscript, but also give a little background, as you were saying, to the history of Italian Jews and how this document is representative in a way, why, why our colleagues in Venice chose it and had it travel from, from Berkeley back to, to Italy to, to exactly. be displayed there. So let's just uh, go ahead and, and first of all, talk about the fact that, you know, most people think about ghettos as place of, of exclusion, but uh, in Jewish terms, in, in terms of Italian Jewish history, they are really places of multiculturalism. Uh, this is my favorite uh, crooked map of Italian Jewish Italy. Uh, it's, it's a map that was published in 1948 uh, by 
uh, by uh, the, the historian Cecil Roth. And I added a few arrows to show how actually Jews arrived to the Italian peninsula from pretty much all over the world that was known in the, in the, in the early modern period. So they arrived from, uh, from uh, Spain, originally from, from Palestine, from Greece, and also from Ashkenaz. So there were, there were Jews of various, uh, various stripes that met in, the, in Italy. And uh, at some point in the early 1500s, uh, containing this diversity uh, became a problem for many Italian nation states and many Italian cities. And this idea of a Jewish quarter a ghetto was, was established. And the word ghetto comes from, comes from, from Venice uh, specifically. And it was an area in the, this is an aerial view of, of Venice, the satellite view of Venice. It was an area in Venice uh, that was already known with the word ghetto. And then by extension became the name of where Jews lived in the city. So within about 50 years, the Jewish quarter in Rome was also referred to as a ghetto, etc. So it's it's a name that we carried in our in our cultural history since then. Uh, let's explore why a ghetto like the ghetto of Venice was multicultural. And here is a more contemporary image of the ghetto. We see the high walls of the buildings. Uh, one could one could gaze from the from the top rooftops of, of of the buildings in the ghetto. One could gaze on on the city of Venice. And here it's how the the main square of the ghetto appears today. Uh, but it's, it's multiculturalism can be seen by analyzing uh, the, the, the buildings themselves. What we see here, we color coded uh, this, uh, this image. This is a section of uh, buildings within the ghetto. It was part of the catalog of the same Venice exhibition that Magnus participated in. Uh, it's an 18th century uh, drawing. And we see that uh, color coding we find in, in, uh, in uh, purple uh, family names. We find we find family names from, from, uh, from the Eastern Mediterranean, in this case, Malta, uh, Valenza, Valencia, so Sephardic names. We find Ashkenazi named here on, on the, on the, in the orange part of the, of the, of the highlight, we, we find the family Tedesco, which means German in, uh, and therefore Ashkenazi in, in Italian. Or in green, we, we, we highlighted an Italian Jewish family name. So the, there is a lot of complexity here. It's kind of similar in a way to the, to the multi-ethnic complexity, complexity of today's state of Israel. Absolutely. But it all happened about 500 years before. So it's kind so of- So just a, a minor, minor difference in terms of the time frames. And um, as, as they, they, you know, the, the old story of the, of, the, of the Jewish Robinson Crusoe who found himself on an island and established not two, but three synagogues, uh, Sephardic and Ashkenazi, and also the synagogue he did not go to. Um, so in the, in the Jewish ghetto of Venice, there were many synagogues. There were two Ashkenazi synagogues, an Italian synagogue, and two Sephardic synagogues, Eastern Mediterranean, Western Mediterranean. And it's, it's even more complex than that. There were also private synagogues and so on. But this is to give you a sense of, of what multiculturalism in a very uh, secluded space could, uh, could mean at the time. And keep so what's going on, you know, as you said. Mm -hmm. Yep. And here is an example of how, you know, if we were to take a peek inside those synagogues, uh, what they would look like. The, the Jewish Museum in Venice is doing incredible work in, in maintaining the synagogue and, and allowing uh, tourists to, to visit them. Um, this is a, actually a, a, a broadside, a print in the Magnus collection that also, I mean, here it all looks Hebrew to us, right? But if we start reading it, we realize that it's, a, it's an other representation of, of, of this multiculturalism. Uh, let me see if I can get back to that page. Here we go. We highlighted again the fact that we have in, uh, in uh, blue uh, Hebrew. So this is Hebrew language. In this case, it's prayers. This is a, a table to teach children uh, to read Hebrew, to pronounce Hebrew, and to, and to, to pray. And then there are a series of blessings and the blessings are introduced and we have a purple uh, highlight. The blessings are, are written in Hebrew characters, but it's really Spanish. And the same way in, uh, in the green highlight, we have the word Venezia and then the word Bragadin, which was the printing press that printed this, this broadside. We're talking early 18th century. So around the time that our graduate that we're going to discuss today lived in uh, Padua and Venice. And uh, let's go and, and, and meet this, uh, this gentleman, right? Uh, he, he was, and we'll, we'll make this argument, he was essentially a, a, an international student. Uh, here he here is. Uh, the, the portrait, so, so when, when, when people graduated from the University of Padua, which was established, it's not the first university established in Italy in the world, it was established in the, in the 12, 1200s, uh, 1222. 
uh, and welcomed all kinds of international students, including Jews. Um, when, when one graduated, it was, it was a diploma in philosophy and medicine. One graduated and got this type of uh, diploma. Did you get something like that when you got your PhD? I got something a little less colorful, I have to admit. Now I'm kind of disappointed, but we yeah. can revisit it later. Well, when I graduated also from, from the Hebrew University, I also got a one pager, but, uh, exactly. but actually from my Italian University, that my diploma would, uh, would, would fit, fit the whole screen today. Uh, so they still kept graduating <laughs> in style in Italy, but uh, not at this level. This was a manuscript, and we'll talk about uh, how it was made in a little bit. But what we see in this manuscript is the, is the um, mention of the graduate. So this is an insight page, and it's very interesting. It's, he's, uh, so he's uh, graduating, we see, in philosophy and, and, and medicine, and he's referred to as the studiosissimus, I'm pronouncing Latin in Italian way, so the studiosissimus Dr. Emanuel Colli, Judeus Anconitanus, uh, Dr. Isaac Filius, essentially the, 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 the Jew from Ancona, doctor and very studious, Dr. Emmanuel Colley, the son of Dr. Isaac. Uh, so there is a patronymic there, but there's also a, 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 a praising uh, uh, term. He's, he's very studious, he's, he's a successful student. In, and, and the whole diploma, we'll discuss it in a little bit, but the whole diploma kind of uh, maps that, uh, that the honors of, of being a graduate of, of this school. Um, it was signed by all of his professors, so we have all kinds of signatures and dates, and, and so it's, uh, it's, uh, it was filled in, in, in all kinds of ways. We have the date, and again, here is referred to, we see on the right uh, uh, quadrant of the page, as excellentissimus, the most excellent Dr. Emmanuel Colli. So uh, in, uh, in uh, years past, these types of documents uh, were interpreted by focusing on the word Jew, Judeus, uh, as if it were a, a badge that was added. But it, in this case, it's really the Jew from Ancona. And we do know that Emmanuel Colley was born in Ancona. And yes. as we will learn, that meant that in order to travel to, to uh, Padua, which was the university campus of the city of Venice, of the Republic of Venice, he had to cross states. So he was, he was essentially an, an international student that was uh, traveling across state. Um, just to, to have a sense, uh, share. Uh, if one graduated and was not a, a Jewish person, would have a different type of diploma with very different iconography, correct? Quite different, and I'm happy to jump in for a second and use my, uh, my art historian skills uh, briefly uh, for the purpose of uh, looking at these two different types of certificates. The one for uh, Emmanuel Colli, for a Jew, of course, and this one that was created for a completely different uh, story for Ferran and Poulain. By the Poulain. same artist. By the same artist, absolutely. And we do know that there are two more of these uh, beautiful certificates created by this artist in existence in other museums around the world. So we know four of these altogether that exist. Um, but if we really uh, dive into the, the, the pages um, and put the two certificates one next to each other, um, we can point out that uh, when the tier, uh, you see the photograph of, uh, of, the, of Emmanuel Colli, the graduate, in the center of the page. That's, that's on the left, right? It's on the left, yes, absolutely. Use my pointer to Thank you. people see it. Perfect. Yes. This so is this, Emmanuel is, Colli. this is Emmanuel Colli, and it's lovely to introduce him to our audience today. And um, he was, as we said, a fantastic doctor. Uh, on top of him in the roundel are uh, two characters, probably a rabbi. And, um, and a, a physician. A, a rabbi um, on the left and a physician on the right. Exactly. Yes. And then and on the, the bottom, bottom, you have the emblem of the Kohli family, a seabird on top of three hills, uh, which is very important for the time. You, you actually see these emblems of these family emblems and you see that not only, of course, for Jewish families, but also for families of all backgrounds and, um, and religions. Uh, these family crests are appear, reappear in different objects that belong to these family members. And of course, on these certificates, they were key. So once again, here on the right, on the bottom, you see an emblem of the, of the family, the Purim family on the bottom there. Yes. Um, and if we go just for a minute uh, to, the, to the center of the, of the certificate on, this, on the right side, then you actually don't see an image of the person who graduated, but you see an emblem possibly, or perhaps it's, uh, it's actually a reference to, uh, to a fairy tale, to a medieval story with a moral. 
um, world that says uh, pride comes before the fall or, you know, don't fall into, into false flattery. Don't let them fool you. Um, and this is a very well-known uh, fairy tale that's also familiar by Aesop's fairy tales of the fox and the chicken. Um, it's, um, and, and again, morals were key, were key and important. And of course, they were very significant in medieval times in medieval manuscripts. And they continued later on and, verse, and appeared uh, very often in 17th century uh, certificates, manuscripts, um, works of art, of course, um, and we can go on and on. Uh, in addition to that, just we marked a few little animals and birds just to point out. So the flies on the left uh, are a medieval symbol of gravity and earthly life. The yellow wallflower represents faithfulness in adversity. The red carnation, we don't know the story there, but it would be worthwhile investigating because it's an emblem of sacred and also profane love. So that would be an interesting route to look into. And on the right, the bird that's there, we were sure it's a dove. For a while, I was late looking into it. And dove, of course, is a very important, um, has very important representation to Christianity. Uh, freedom, connection between heaven and earth, the representation of, of uh, the body of Christ, of course. But it's, this could also be, and this is a fun story, this could also be a pulver bird. A pulver bird in medieval times believed to have a supernatural power to cure diseases. So the legend said that in order, in order to cure a patient, the bird was brought into its bedside. And if the bird looked, turned her head away from the patient, that was the end. The patient would not recover. End of story. He would, pa he would pass up and move on to the next world. But if the bird looked at him, it drew the disease into itself and the patient could immediately recover and recuperate. So that was a very interesting story. Then finally, in the bottom, we have a peacock. We can't uh, not mention the peacock because it's a very important bird, uh, uh, very important in Christianity. But here it probably appears to actually remind us once again of the, the, um, the effects of pride and how we can't fall and let pride, uh, pride um, uh, affect us in a bad way. We can't, um, we can't allow ourselves to expose our ugly vanity in the face of, of, uh, of the world. So, uh, so these are just a few of these of thoughts. Let's this. also remind that the, the family crest of the Colley family is, uh, is actually a visual pun. Uh, yes. The, the seabird <laughs> is standing on three hills and the Italian word for hills is Colli, which is the family name. So uh, it's, it's both a verbal and visual pun on, on, on the family name itself. Um, and here we are with like even more details of, uh, exactly. of the comparison. So we, we, of course, we have a image, images of Christianity for, for the Christian graduate. And as you were saying, reminder of Judaism here, the relationship between physicians and rabbis uh, very much highlighted yes. in, this, in this document. Exactly. Um, again, to remember ourselves uh, uh, of, of the, the international travels of this, uh, of this doctor, of this graduate. Emmanuel Colley was born in 1657 in Ancona and then traveled to, um, to Padua around here, here, and then eventually spent the rest of his life as a physician in the ghetto of Venice. We know all of this because he actually, he, he, in Venice, he was studying Jewish studies. He had teachers. He was studying with a famous Kabbalist at the time, Josef Piazza, and, and also because he published in Hebrew and in Italian. So we have information about him. So he's a known character in, in, in history. Um, he's not just any graduate and probably in those days, really nobody, not that these days that's true, but nobody was any graduate. Um, let's just remind ourselves of, of this transition between Venice and Padua. So Padua was the, was the, uh, the seat of the University of the Republic of Venice. It was kind of like, you know, with us in the Bay Area, you know, in the, the city of San Francisco, and then, you know, the various campuses in Berkeley, at Stanford, etc. So, and, and it, it, it still conserves the earliest known anatomical theater in, uh, in Europe. Uh, this is where the classes of anatomy were, were taking place. So there is a lot of iconography uh, going on here. Uh, but in terms of, of Jewish uh, dynamics, um, Padua and, uh, and uh, Venice were very much connected. Here is an example. This is most likely the synagogue where Emmanuel Colli, who was an Italian Jew, not a Sephardic Jew, or an Ashkenazi Jew, but an Italian Jew of Italy, uh, the synagogue he most likely attended. And uh, the Italian synagogue in, in Padua, which was a hub for all the international Jewish scholars that were coming 
and learning at the University of Padua and, and getting degrees. And uh, here is the, the Italian synagogue in the ghetto of Venice, uh, where he prob probably the one he frequented. And I, I believe he might have frequented this because his teacher was a pupil of Leone Modena, who, who had been uh, the cantor of that synagogue and was a very, very interesting character, a rabbi, a scholar, a writer, a poet, a musician. And uh, here I, I, just as a reminder, I, I, I I dropped in in, the, in this slide a poem he wrote when he was very young. He was in his teens, in, and it was in memory of his teacher. And, uh, and he wrote it in Hebrew and, uh, and uh, in Italian. Uh, uh, Shira, are you able to read the Hebrew, the first, just the first yes. sentence? And in Italian, it's Kinashe Mor Oime Ke Passacerbo. So essentially, this is a poem that uh, it's two poems, one in Hebrew, one in Italian, but they sound pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the idea of this cultural, multicultural symbiosis of, of the ghettos of Italy, not just place of exclusion, but also places of inclusion and, uh, and of encounter. Um, we close by thinking together about that roundel in the, in the top of the manuscript. Rabbis and doctors. This is a, a fascinating topic that we could probably talk about for, for hours, but uh, let's just leave it at the fact that uh, uh, they're celebrated here. It's very iconic. And the relationship between rabbis and doctors, specifically in Padua, was studied in the, at the time of the Renaissance and shortly thereafter, was studied by, by an Italian-Israeli uh, historian, Robert Bonfield, who started reading university diplomas like the one we are discussing today, and also rabbinic diplomas. And what he learned is that rabbinic diplomas in Italy from that time were written essentially as Hebrew translator, translations of the Latin documents that the universities were producing. And that rabbinical schools were in a way graduating Jewish doctors, not as in physicians, but doctors of the law. So rabbis and physicians here are both doctors and it often happened and continues to happen to this day that the chief rabbi of Rome is both an, a physician and a rabbi, meaning a doctor of the law. But basically the idea was that rabbis started presenting themselves, not just as spiritual guides, as some kind of Jewish priests, uh, but very much as scholars, uh, as, 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 as intellectuals and Jewish academics. So there is a lot to unpack in this, uh, in this document and we are delighted to, to share it with others. And I think we have some questions, right? Yes, so. yes. So um, we, have, we have a few very good questions. Um, let me read uh, just a couple to you for, to start with. Um, Beth asks, uh, she, sa she said she thought that the word ghetto comes from stone quarry. Huh. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not going to go, this would be another lecture, another zooming in maybe. Excellent. Time, but January. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> But uh, the, the scholarly consensus is that the area where the ghetto was established in, in Venice um, was in, called ghetto from the Italian gettare, to throw and to cast. And it was, in, in fact, it was, there was a foundry there. Uh, so probably that's the origin, but it remains in a way a mysterious origin. Uh, so we're not really, really sure what, uh, uh, what the word really meant be, beyond indicating a place. It's interesting that within half a century, it started to mean what we know today, a place of seclusion mm -hmm. in which a group yeah. is kind of enforceably uh, contained. Yeah. Um, could you comment on why Venice would have been a destination for Jews from so many places? Oh, well, Venice in the, you know, Venice in the 1500s is like saying uh, Paris in the 19th century, New York in the 20th. I'm not exactly. sure exactly what a 20th <laughs> cent 21st century comparison would be, but it was, it was one of those places that everybody wanted and needed to be in, mostly for trade. Uh, it was international trade and Jews, among other things, were able to secure trade with the Ottoman Empire, with the Muslim world. So many Jews were, were transitional figures that traveled back and forth and had many identities. It's a, it's a, it's a long and fascinating story. How did travelers get lodging and food when there were no hotels or Airbnbs? <laughs> uh, well, I'm, 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 not, I'm not a historian of, of, <laughs> of, of hospitality, but actually, um, before the ghetto was established in 1516 in Venice, the Venice ghetto, Jews were actually not allowed to live in the city. Of course, many Jews did live there as illegal residents, illegal immigrants, nothing new under the sun. But those who were following the rules 
were able to ferry themselves in from the mainland into the city. So they, they would use boats, of course. Nowadays, there, is a, there isn't a train that comes into, into Venice. There is a train station. By the time, there was no, no such thing. So they would ferry themselves in and, uh, and uh, would be allowed to stay from between one to three days. So of course, they had to secure hospitality. And they were, they were tavernas. They were, they were, they were uh, sort of forms of hotels at the time. It's just definitely not Airbnb, but... Uh, yeah, if you look at the Canterbury Tales, you can probably think of that little place where they're all being hosted. Um, Do we have um, more questions? Yes, we have some wonderful questions. Um, and I have a few questions for you as well, so you might uh -oh. need to stay late. Um, <laughs> did the university have a dedicated art production department, or did more people have good drawing skills? Uh, well, do you want to take that question? I could, but essentially there were some artists who served the graduates. Most yes, likely these, exactly. these, these diplomas were paid for by the graduates and their families, not by the university. Yes, it and was as if a separate photographer would, uh, would uh, go to your, to your home or come to the university, especially for you, and take your portrait and really dedicate a lot of time and effort to create something that's very individualized and personal. Um, how does this compare to the diplomas of non-Jews from the same graduation class? Well, I'm not sure that we're able to calculate the exact graduation class, but we did present a comparison in a way, right? Yes, so. and we know that there are two more that exist. Uh, another one of, of a Jew, actually, and another one of a Christian. Uh, one in Canada and one in Jerusalem in Israel. So it's worthwhile to investigate that further. Uh, was the combined philosophy and medicine degree also the case for other academic disciplines, um, combine, combining philosophy with other degrees, or is it likely that Colley himself chose to study both? Well, that, if, you know, I, maybe they're asking the right person, but maybe not because I could give too long of an answer. I do have a <laughs> doctoral degree in philosophy mm -hmm, not in exactly. from Italy. Um, it was basically, what it, what, it, what it meant is that it was an all-encompassing degree. And again, we have to think back about the meaning of the word university. University comes from the Latin uni, universitas studiorum, the, the universality of studies. So basically graduates would go to university to learn all known, I'm using quotation marks on Zoom, all known, uh, all known subjects, including, of course, medicine. Jews were allowed to be doctors, but why? they couldn't participate in, in so many professions. Well, they could definitely participate in, in the medical profession. There is a long history of that, including of Jewish physicians being the, the, the physicians of popes in Rome. And, uh, and it's, it's a long tradition, and actually a tradition that we, we have a fantastic colleague at UC Berkeley, John Efron, who studied uh, the history of Jewish doctors and who'd be much, a much better person to answer the, this question than than I am. What I was pointing to here uh, was really the, the, the similarities in the, in the, in the diplomas of, of doctors and, and uh, university graduates and rabbis, and the idea that rabbis and doctors are not just two categories, but are two very comparable uh, categories in, from an intellectual history standpoint. Do we have more questions? We have one more question, and I wanted to squeeze in another question, if I'm allowed. So I'll start with the other question, and we'll end with mine, perhaps, unless somebody else comes in. How was the diploma document maintained to survive to modern times and the university, family, et cetera? I guess one word, parchment. It was written on parchment, not on paper. So it lasted a long time. It lasted to our days. Um, the history of this manuscript is complex, but again, we're not going to talk about that, how it came to the Magnus, etc. But it That's was, a different it, talk. It was an acquisition. That is very much a different talk. So, Shir, you want to get catch me by surprise with a with a question, and then yes, we'll yes, and then we can take and then we can let everybody go off to their lunches and their nice long weekends. Um, I want. I was. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the the dominant traditions. Uh, in the in the Venice ghetto of between all of the synagogues there and the different backgrounds of uh, of people of the multicultural Jewish people there, was there some kind of a hierarchy of Jewish cultures, uh, and is there a dominant tradition that survived until today? Ha! Huh. So that that's supposed to be a question and answer in thirty seconds. Uh, that's all we have left. Uh, <laughs> you're going to time me, but basically. Uh, 
there was competition among the different constituencies, not just in the Veliz ghetto, but in pretty much any community that had multiple constituencies. And uh, what, what Jews realized is that they had to negotiate their differences in order to be represented and be and be recognized in front of the state, in this case, the Republic of, of Venice. So a sense of unity had to be created. However, different congregations and different groups existed and continue to exist almost to this day. Now, nowadays, the Jewish community in Venice has shrunk to just uh, a few hundreds of people, but uh, the synagogues are there, the traditions are still somewhat there. And I actually gave a talk about the Ashkenazi tradition in Venice for the Jewish community of Venice just a few months ago. So uh, it was another Zoom talk. And that's what we do these days, right? And yep. speaking of that, um, next week, we're meeting again, right? Yes. Here and Thank you for joining us. Together. Yeah. Next week, we'll be talking about uh, expressions of nature in an early 20th century carpet created in Betel, the Betel School in Jerusalem. Um, and we hope to see you then. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nat, our colleague, for your help in managing this, uh, this webinar. And we hope to see you next week. Um, please Email us with any more questions and have a wonderful weekend. And thank you, Shir, for being such a wonderful partner every week. It's so good thank to, get to hang out with you. And thank you to all of the participants that uh, follow us from all over pretty much the world. So we're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Good. Goodbye. Bye.